Brothers and sisters, this is the day that the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome, my friends, whether out there joining us on YouTube or here in the sanctuary to the second Sunday of Advent. It is a blessed season, and I thank you for making worship a part of the rhythm of your lives. For those of you who are out there, um, later on we'll have a sharing of what's going on in our life and prayers, as we always do, so you're welcome to text those into me at any time. Let's talk about a few more signs of Advent we have going on here at the church. We always like to celebrate community giving, and we have some things to celebrate this morning. This church has been partners with Project We Care for a number of years now, and Project We Care as many of you know, has changed the last couple of years of how they do it, um, but the giving has not changed. So this year, this congregation, we wrote the check to them this week for 11, over $1,100 um, to help them provide gifts for families in the Millard School District. So thank you for all of you who gave your generosity there. And another thing to celebrate as far as generosity goes, y'all, we have funded almost, we're at 11.6 wells, okay? $450 a well, you can do the math there. We're almost there, $5,200 given, okay? We did this last in 2019, we over doubled it. Now, the mission committee has decided this is a mission that we're gonna keep on doing past 2021 into 2022. But we also decided that we would like to send them the money before the end of the year here. So you have a couple weeks. If you would like to donate any, you know, that'll go in this batch, feel free to do that. Just write out a separate check, right, to Wells Ministry or Wells or anything like that just to note it, okay? But we will continue to, to collect that going on into 2022 as well. Another sign of Advent. You cannot miss the children's program this year. It's December 19th, right here, 10 a.m. worship. Um, the kids are practicing and coming up with something that's very special and great. All of this and so much more you can read about in the newsletter, which just came out this week through your email. If you're not getting that and want it, um, let well, you can let Marcia know, you can let me know, um, and we'll get you on the list. There's also some copies available out in the Family Life Center of our excellent newsletter. And I've been asked, and it's true, it's not too late, so we collect pledges every year for the next year. If you haven't gotten yours in, don't fret. We would love to have that turned in if you're planning on doing it by next Sunday, the 12th, okay? <coughs> We have some of those available at our Family Life Center, too. So if you haven't done it yet, it's not too late. And it matters. It matters to the life of this church. Today at Faithful Shepherd, we got some things going on. It is the second Sunday of Advent. We continue on in our worship series, a uh, series of Advent Conspiracy. Um, this one, we focus on worshiping fully. Worshiping fully, well have a good time in the sermon exploring some of the characters from the, the uh, birth of Christ story uh, and how we can worship right along with them, use them as our models. You are invited to the table. So you at home, if you have some elements, you can use it at home while we uh, are at that part. Otherwise, in here, if you didn't get um, some of your elements, we have them sitting out in the narthex for you. You can get up and... <laughs> Grab those um, when you can. As always, I do thank you for your generosity. There's um, plates in the front and the back. You can give and turn anything in at any time that you'd like. And again, as we are a welcoming congregation for everyone at this time, I do appreciate and thank you for uh, wearing your mask during worship. As it is Advent, our call to worship this morning surrounds ourselves, or surrounds the lighting of the Advent wreath and candles. So I'd like to invite Marion and Sydney to come on up and help with that. Please stand as you are able and let us join together in the call to worship. Wow. 
O oh God, we light the candles of hope and peace. We seek your comfort, both mighty and tender, you come. Prepare our hearts to be transformed by you. Isaiah announced God's coming to a people exiled in a broken and parched wilderness. He declared that God's redemption would make a highway in the desert and change the rough places into plain. God would come as a shepherd, feeding, leading, and cradling the weary flock. This Advent, we seek such a God. Seeking God, look upon your world and heal your land and your people. Prepare us to be changed. This Advent, teach us to be tender and just as you are. Amen. Our opening hymn is Advent Song, verses 1 and 2. <coughs> The words are on the screen and in the small hymnal on page 2090. The wilderness will rejoice. The dry land will blossom. The people of God will return with joy and singing. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Very small, the good news. I invite the kids to come on up.
I didn't know this about poinsettias, but somebody showed me a picture. Um, so they don't grow here, they grow where it's warm all the time. We think of Mexico, we think of places in Central America. But they grow in real bushes, shrubs that are almost as tall as your second story window sometimes. Isn't that incredible? We always see them like this. They do remind us of Christmas and Advent. Okay, so I was just um, struck by something that we prayed together in the prayer of confession, and it said something about seeing God in the unexpected places. Okay? So let me ask you this first. Where do you expect to see and feel God? Where do you expect that to happen? In heaven, absolutely. Where do you expect that to happen? In the church. In the church. Where else do you expect it to happen? Look at With me, yes. Where else do you expect to see and feel God? Yeah. With everyone. With everyone. Oh, that's a good answer. Anywhere else? Those are really good answers, Connor. Everywhere. Everywhere. You are really good. You're, you got it down. Because the next question I was going to ask is, where are the unexpected places you're going to find God? So let's use our imagination. That's a good answer. Anywhere else? Those are really good answers, Connor. Everywhere. Everywhere. Well, where? Do you think you can find God riding in your car? You don't think so? You don't think so? You do? How? What could, where could God show up riding in your car? Um, in our hearts. In your hearts? Absolutely. Yeah, and in your tummy, yeah, yeah, yeah. What about at a restaurant? Do you think God would show himself at a restaurant? Yeah. How? Because he gets our hearts. In your hearts, yeah, that's right. Yeah, Emily? I know that wherever you go, God will follow. Yeah, absolutely, God will follow. And, he, and God shows up to you in your heart, but also, so I heard about people, right? What about the people who serve us in a restaurant? The food that we eat, we give thanks to God for, no matter where we are. Driving in a car, you see some beautiful landscapes driving by, maybe. You can give thanks to God for that. So I challenge you, and it sounds like a real challenge here, to look for God in the unexpected places. But you all hit it really well when you said, God is always in our hearts, isn't, isn't he? Let us pray together. Dear God, we praise you, and we thank you for the way you show yourselves in all the expected and especially the unexpected places in our lives. Amen. Uh, nursery is open for anybody younger than kindergarten if you want to go in there. And otherwise, I got some new coloring sheets back in the narthex if you want to do some of those. The Old Testament reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 9. Verses 2 through 7. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. 
and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The word of the Lord.
Here I go breaking my own rule. Don't you love doing that? Um, they they really put it in your heart and your mind in seminary. There's a difference between Advent and Christmas, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm glad that is yes, the teaching is sticking here. Um, Christmas happens Christmas, and then the twelve days following. That's when you sing the Christmas songs. That's when you tell the story. So I'm breaking that rule. Nobody write an email <laughs> to the University of the Theological Seminary. I think I'm far enough removed it wouldn't matter anyway. <laughs> We're going to tell the Christmas story because in order to talk about how to worship Jesus at Christmas, we have to. And then to double down, we're going to sing a, a Christmas hymn uh, to go out on our way. I know, right? It's crazy here. This place is crazy. As we turn to Luke 2, um, verses 8 through 20, let us turn to God in our hearts in prayer. God, we thank you for your living and real spirit that it makes all things fresh and new for us, and it is what convicts us and what takes the words of this just beautiful story and makes them real. So today I pray that that happened to us. May we enter in this Christmas story in a new way, as it's read, as it's reflected on, and then as it enters our hearts. This I pray through Christ Jesus. Amen. And whenever I read this, I can't help talking just about worship and the Christmas program. I was probably 9 or 10 years old when I landed the role of Linus in Panama Presbyterian Church's production of A Charlie Brown Christmas. And one of Linus's main things, you know the story, right? When Charlie Brown loses his mind at the end there. Can somebody tell me the true meaning of Christmas? You remember that? And Linus steps on Linus steps on stage. I had to memorize this back then. And he had some, he said something like this. And there were shepherds living out in a field nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. 
Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared, and the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that had been heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And that, Charlie Brown, is the true meaning of Christmas. <laughs> this Advent, through our challenge, we are challenged to worship fully. Worshiping fully is the first tenet of the four of the Advent conspiracy. We introduced this last week. The conspiracy has, that word has weight with it, but this is to conspire together, yes, to be anti-cultural in such a way that we focus on what Advent is truly about. So let us begin by asking ourselves, what is worship? I mean, what is it? Worship is a few things. It is adoration. It is praise. It is focus. During Advent, there are things that certainly steal away our worship from Jesus. And that is due to that the things that we desire are the things we worship. The things we desire are the things we worship. Our hearts are formed by what we worship, as a matter of fact. Excitement, anticipation, hope, each of these emotions swells around the object of our dearest affection. And we spend our time and our energy on what matters the most to us. So the event of Christmas, then, and you know what I mean by the event of Christmas, and all that surrounds that event, it's a paradox and it's odd, but it's true. It is enough to become its own false idol of our worship, right? Christmas itself. So our goal and our challenge these weeks is to bring our centering focus and then our adoration and our joy back to the purpose of Christmas, all this waiting and anticipation, to the purpose of all of this preparation and paying attention really is the first step. The things we desire are the things we worship. So during Advent, a time of consumption, we need to look closely at what we want and what we desire. What is it we want and desire? And then think beyond your well-rehearsed responses to that question. I, I cherish these children up here and, the, and their answers to that question. Let us think beyond the well-rehearsed responses and strive to discover what is really in our hearts as we prepare. So I invite you this Advent, as a matter of fact, I invite you today to begin and to re-enter the Christmas story. And I hope you listen to it in a new way as I just read it. Place yourself back in that story of Christ's birth. Be blown away by the story again. Blown away by it. You should be. Cry a little bit when you consider Mary having a baby in the midst of those conditions in such a way. How that came to be and what that meant. Enter into the characters, these shepherds, as uh, the King James pushed it, that were sore afraid, right, of this angel. Enter into that 
unbelievable scene. What we're going to do today is enter into the story through a different uh, characters that we just know so well. And then at the end, I'm just going to have just a moment of reflection for you, about one minute, for you to consider the characters and who you relate to. So we begin with Mary, the one who accepted the invitation. A teenage girl engaged to marry a poor carpenter named Joseph, living on the dusty fringes of the Roman Empire. One day, out of nowhere, God's archangel, Gabriel, visits Mary one night with the shocking news that she will miraculously form a child within her who is God's son. Mary's response to all of this is one of the greatest poems that we have in all of our scriptures. We call it the Magnificat from the first word in Latin, my soul magnifies the Lord, her song, her poem of response. It's an announcement. It's an announcement that God is here. But it's not just that. It is a poem that drifts with calls for justice because God is here. Society is going to be turned upside down because God is here. Mary's worship of Jesus begins truly with the most ultimate of paradoxes. And God loves a good paradox. You know that, right? A young girl, unwed and without any power, influence, or wealth, cradles within her womb the divine power of the universe. How's that for a paradox? May our worship be like Mary's, accepting God's crazy invitation into our lives in the most unexpected of ways as we pour out our heart. May our worship drive us then to that call for justice that's in that Magnificat from this church out into the painful places that cry out for God's liberation. May we worship like Mary. Next we have Elizabeth. So very soon after Gabriel announced Mary's soul needed soothed, we do some reading between the lines here about what she must be feeling and what it must have been like, but we know the context of which it was. She needed a safe place where she could go to escape Escape a tiny village that couldn't help but know this. Escape the whispers. Escape what could be real harm to her. Mary needed somewhere that she was going to be shown true hospitality. And Elizabeth showed her that hospitality. Elizabeth provided a safe and loving refuge for her cousin, who it would have been easy for us to assume was questioned and possibly even rejected by everyone else, Mary. We too are called in our worship, it is an act of worship to practice hospitality like Elizabeth. Now how can hospitality become a true form of our worship? Here's what I thought of. This Christmas coming up, even as you welcome, yes, your family, into your house. Maybe especially as you do this year. I invite you to see it in a new way. Who's hosting? Just a show of hands. Who's hosting a Christmas something or other happening? Yeah, you hosters, okay? See it in a new way. If it's you who's hosting, don't approach it with a rolling of the eyes, or with anxiety over the state of your house. <laughs> See it as the worship of God. See it as the worship of God. Now, if you're being welcomed, some of you who aren't hosting are being welcomed somewhere. 
See it in a new way. Be graciously welcomed in to this person's home this year. Hospitality is an ancient practice, and it is worship. And then there's Joseph. Don't look past the truth that Joseph was sort of this, although poor, a model citizen in the Roman Empire, who went from model citizen, I mean, this is tabloid stuff today, to the soap opera star overnight, right? <laughs> Seriously. His fiance is pregnant and the baby is not his, y'all. Joseph had choices to make in all this. Choices. And do not discount these choices. They were real. One choice Joseph could have made was to subject Mary to both public shame and harsh punishment. That was a choice Joseph could have made. Instead, Joseph made maybe the more civil choice to divorce or to drop the engagement quietly without making a deal with it, but yet not taking Mary to be his bride. So he makes that decision, and then that's when he gets his visit from the angel. Joseph's response from his visit is one of obedience. However scared he was of what this might do to his life, he still took Mary to be his wife. He still decided to help raise a child that was not his. He was a fool, but, but he was a holy fool, and God loves holy fools. He gave up his reputation and his rights because of a call he received from God. As a true follower of Christ, or as someone who maybe puts some of these tenets into practice, some people are going to think you're weird, you're strange, you're odd. Let Joseph be the one to give you confidence and help you remember that while the call of God is not often easy or conventional, it is always right. And God will give you the courage to follow if you're willing to obey. And up next we have then our shepherds. We've heard this before, but you've got to hear it again. Understand again who the shepherds were or weren't, rather. At this time, in first century Palestine, shepherds were despised. Often they were thieves, or they were laid out to be, and they were unfit for more respectable occupations. Their testimony, as a matter of fact, How's this for a paradox? Their testimony was not allowed in civil court at the time. They were so not trusted. Nor their presence on society. That's why they hung in the fields. So shepherds found their places on the outskirts of towns. They were often really young or aged, old. And they even sometimes female. We always think of them as male, but sometimes female. And they were largely shunned by the mainstream population. And yet these people who had no testimony in court were chosen to be bearers, witnesses to the miracle of the birth of Jesus. I told you God loves a good paradox. After hearing from God, the shepherds immediately went to witness the miracle for themselves, and then they spread that glorious news far and wide. Here's the challenge of the shepherds. What responsibility are you willing to leave, or at least stop and pause, to stop everything to see the miracle that is about to happen? What are you willing to just stop in your busyness to see the miracle? Are you willing to pause long enough to leave the fields and go to the manger to look upon the Lord? True worship takes stopping 
our work to behold the miraculous sight. And finally, in our character study today, we have the Magi. The Magi are crucial to this story because they came from the outside in. They came from the outside, way from the outside. They were scholars and astrologers from Persia and Babylon. Those are all to the east and northeast of Palestine of Israel. From the time the Jews were exiled there, they carried their stories. They knew about the coming king foretold by the Jews. When they arrived in Jerusalem, the Magi faced then the tyranny of Herod. Right? They went right to Herod to find out. It was truly and dangerously powerful people who were in charge. And they were in charge as truly dangerously and powerful people are. Not just being brutish and strong and bullish, but a guy like Herod was powerful due to scheming and carefully crafted relationships, even among the Jewish elite. And the Magi here show up and they show the courage to ask Herod for directions on where to find the one true king, obviously not him, so they could go worship the one true king. They faced one kind of a power face to face and named in his face that there was a greater power. We too have our choice of kings. Which one is worthy of our worship? Don't discount that the visit that the Magi made could have cost them their lives. But instead they showed us what happens when someone catches even a glimpse of the matchless Christ. He is worthy of all honor, glory, and praise. We too should be willing to travel across the world to confront dominant world systems and to give up all we have to come and worship Christ the King. So this Advent, this Christmas, I invite you to enter in once more. There they are again for you up there. Be invited to do so. You are a part of the story. I have a couple of reflection questions here that I want us to spend about one minute. Just read them, reflect amongst yourselves. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we continue through the Advent season, we pray that you give us hearts for full worship of you. Help us to enter into the story and help us be inspired by any one of these characters and find in our own lives where we might open our hearts in our worship of Christ our King, the one who has come, the one who is yet to. It's through his name I pray. Amen. I invite you to uh, stand and body your spirit for our song of response. Come, thou long expected Jesus.
You may be seated. So when I think about hospitality, I think about welcome, I think many of us think about eating when we think about hospitality. Um, often I do. So how fitting is it that we gather today here at the table? We've gotten well skilled at this, so <laughs> there's a, I, and I know you just love my little tutorials every time. There is a very thin, clear uh, wrapper that has your wafer, and then under that has your juice. If you need help, find a neighbor and they'd be <laughs> glad to have it. I know some of you got really good at it. it took me about 14 months, but yeah. <laughs> as we gather together at the table, uh, the elements are simple, but they are wonderful. They are means of grace. We are invited. We come just as who we are, because we can't come any other way than that. If we come pretending that we're somebody we're not, that doesn't work. So come as who you are. As part of that, we come sharing what's going on in our lives, um, that which weighs us down, that which with, lifts, lifts us up. Um, I have a couple prayers to, that I've had submitted that I'll share before you. And um, ask if you have any that you would like uh, to pray over. Two prayers of, of concern. One um, comes from Donna Campbell. And it is prayer for her and her family at the passing of her cousin Tom Campbell. Um, a really difficult and sad situation where um, he, was, he was found in his home during a wellness check. Um, so as the family grieves... That kind of a loss, we pray with you, Donna, and um, with the family of uh, Tom as they grieve that loss. And I also received a prayer online from Colette Hughes, and this is a prayer for uh, her late husband Jim's sister, Libby, Libby, who had a liver transplant on Friday. She reports that surgery went well, and she is up and talking. So we give thanks that Libby had a successful surgery and, and is on her way to recovery. We also think of our dear sister, Linda Highmarsh. Maybe out there watching, she had a, I talked to her this week, she had a successful knee surgery uh, replacement on Monday, um, and she is doing well recovering with that. Any other prayers that you want to lift up here today as we gather at the table, Kathleen? Our son-in-law, Colin, um, returns from deployment on Thursday. Praise God. Son-in-law, Colin, returns from deployment on Thursday. What a great time for that. Um, I bet he just misses his family so much. So praise God for that, for Colin coming back. Jean. Um, David Mead gave birth to a little boy last Tuesday. Uh -huh. uh, he had, he was early, uh -huh. about four weeks early. He only weighed two pounds, had a lot of issues. They rushed him to Omaha and he died on Thursday. Okay. And the family is very, very, very heartbreaking. It is. It's heartbreaking. So this is for the you said the niece of David. Yes. Um, had a had a child um, early in pregnancy, a small child, and that baby ended up dying after being rushed uh, to the hospital here in Omaha. So during a heartbreaking um, moment for that family, we lift up prayers of support during this time. Anybody, any others you'd like to lift up? Let us give thanks to our God. Oh God, it is truly right, it is our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise. O oh Lord, our God, creator and ruler of the universe, as you promised long ago, you have revealed the majesty of your name in a little child born in Bethlehem. He is our joy and our peace. He is our shepherd, feeding us with mercy and leading us in safety. 
Therefore, God, we praise you and we join our voices with choirs of angels, with prophets, with apostles, with martyrs, and with all the faithful of every time and place. And we forever sing to the glory of your name, holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Born of Mary, Jesus Christ is our salvation and our strength, the fulfillment of your word and the hope of generations. Christ lifts up the lowly and fills the hungry with good things. And we remember your gracious acts in Jesus Christ. And we take from your creation this bread and this cup, and we joyfully celebrate.